Hi, today is a history lesson about the personal computer. I wanted to show you what the original computer was. This is before silicon was used. Computers used to be made out of these things, vacuum tubes. And so in the 1940s, the first computer was built using 18,000 of these things. They, um, they are kind of like a light bulb, except they have the ability to amplify signals and to turn electricity on and off really fast. And that's why they were used for early computers, is their ability to turn things on and off really fast. And the on and off then represents the zeros and the ones. So can you imagine the amount of heat that these things generated, just like light bulbs have 18,000 of them? And they used to burn out all the time. So later on, computers were made out of silicon chips. And I'm going to show you some of the stuff um, about that right now. So today's presentation really is the history of personal computing instead of large-scale computing. Personal computing really started from Intel Corporation when they invented the things that are shown here, um, basically initially for adding machines, but later on for computers. And this is called a microprocessor. And so Intel's first microprocessor was the Model 4004, and it was created in 1971. And that computer chip cost $60.00. And you had to build your own computer to make it work. And I'll show you about that in just a second. A couple of years later, Intel came out with a more advanced version, uh, $420. And then a couple of years or one year later, they came out with even, even more advanced version. So just the computer chip by itself was $200. And it was something you had to use. Um, you had to build your own computer. So this shows a kit to the person putting together a computer. And really, the first personal computer was made out of this. It was made from a kit, and it was from a company called Altair. It was a build-it-yourself computer, so it had the microprocessor, and then all of the components that are used to connect things to it. So for $400, you could get a kit to build your own computer. And that was made popular in 1975 through an article in the Popular Electronics magazine. So it showed how to build the computer, and... That's what it ended up looking like if you built it. It's got a bunch of switches on the front of it, and it's got a bunch of red lights. And so if you wanted to make things happen, you had to make those switches go up or down, which was 0 or 1. And that's how you programmed it, was through those switches. Later, somebody came along and created a computer terminal that would connect to the Altair computer. And so the computer terminal is a keyboard and a video monitor. And that was something that was used to connect to that. At the beginning, these things were very expensive. The terminals were very expensive, even a couple of thousand dollars. And then later, they came down in price. Uh, but that was what this cost. So can you imagine if you had to buy a terminal and build your own computer? And that's what the beginning of personal computing was like. This is another kit. And this is pretty significant because this kit comes from Apple Corporation. So this is the Apple One computer. And so for $666.66, you could, you could buy a kit and build your own Apple computer. This is the very beginning. So you, you can see some of the specifications for there. They're kind of funny by today's standards. Uh, also, something that's rather quaint is down in the lower right there, you can see the address that, where Apple started. Uh, 770 Welch Road, Suite 154. That is a garage. It's the garage of the parents of one of the people who started Apple, Steve Jobs, and so that's where he used to live. And that was uh, his garage, and that's how the company started. So in 1976, that was where personal computing um, was, at least as far as Apple was concerned. Apple did not use Intel technology. They used something from a company called MOS, so MOS technology, and their Model 6502 was the Apple CPU. There are some other things that happened. Several companies came along and started building computers for personal use. Atari was one of the first ones, and they made a computer that really all it did was play computer games, and it, de it demonstrated the ability to have graphics, and it could play music, and it was mainly used for gaming. Um, another one came along. It was from a com company called Commodore, so the Commodore 64. Uh, it's about a $600 computer, again, just ma mainly for gaming, um, but it had some other applications, but at the beginning was main mainly entertainment. Texas Instruments used to sell a personal computer. This is Bill Cosby doing some advertising for them. Uh, they were better known for a company that was uh, the inventor of uh, integrated circuits, and then later on they become 
a company that became very big in uh, calculators, personal calculators. But for a while, they did sell personal computers. Uh, those also came, again, from Commodore. The Commodore 64 was something that was competing against the Apple II and the Radio Shack computer and the IBM PC. And so they had a, a lower price computer. For a long time, Radio Shack was the leader in personal computers. And it may be hard to believe because the company's out of business now, but for $600, you could get a computer. You didn't even have to have a kit. It would just come as, as a complete computer that you could use. Uh, you didn't have to build it yourself. The only storage they could think of for that, this is before disk, disk drives were used in the computer. The only storage they can think of was a cassette tape. And if you know anything about uh, music, they used to have music on cassette tapes, but they were also used for computer storage. Uh, the only problem with these things is they were extremely slow. So if you wanted to store or retrieve data from the tape, you had to wait even uh, several minutes to have this ha uh, have data be able to be stored and retrieved. So pretty slow, but at the beginning of personal computing, that's what things were about, and that's how data got stored. So Radio Shack has a long history. They uh, have this next model is their TRS-80 Model 4. So it was they, they had several models ahead of that. You can see the pricing. This is a $1,300 computer. And you, you may be able to read some of the specifications, but it was uh, something that had very small memory by today's standards. And Radio Shack realized that uh, this was something that was rather expensive for the time, so they had a uh, lease that they would offer. And so you can see there it says $73 a month, and that's for uh, a lease for this computer. So rather than purchasing it, a lot of businesses were leasing these things. Apple Computer came out with another model. The Apple I uh, was the kit, and then the Apple II was something that was a self-contained computer. So they, they became pretty well known in the education market because they actually literally gave computers to a lot of elementary schools around the country just to start the people using Apple computers. And, and so it's got some specifications. You may be able to see it. It was also about $1,300 for this personal computer. Uh, but at the beginning, a lot of people didn't buy it just because Apple was giving them away to schools. And then later on, people were buying those things. Um, Apple had kind of a hard time selling these things. And so I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. The Radio Shack computers started having more capability and they started becoming more expensive. So uh, in 1984, you can see this is a $5,000 personal computer. So personal computing prices used to be really high and then they came down as the technology became more pervasive. Finally, somebody introduced the concept of hard disk drive storage for personal computers. And so at the beginning, a 10 megabyte hard drive was about $6,000. And that, that sounds like an amazing price when you consider what uh, today's hard drives are, $50 or $60 for terabytes worth of storage. So there's huge magnitudes of difference between the two. But at the beginning, it was a fairly expensive technology. And then the technology got better and it bega became cheaper. And so... At some point, the 10 megabyte hard drives were about $3,500 instead of the $6,000. And then Radio Shack came out with more expensive products. So you can see the, the complete system on the left is an $8,500 personal computer, and the one on the right is um, almost $6,900 for a personal computer. And you can see what some of the specifications are for these things. So um, they were touting the whole technology of hard disk drives for storage that was all new to personal computers at that point, but really expensive. And Radio Shack's most expensive computer system was about $10,000. And it had, uh, the computer was on the top and then had a lot of storage on the bottom. It, it came in this desk and there was some storage file cabinets even with it. Uh, but that was, that was a system that for a long time, this was the most expensive and most powerful personal computer that you could get. You know, it's interesting, Radio Shack's not even business, in business anymore, and they were completely eclipsed by another product. And the product was ended up being an IBM PC, but it was competing against products that were almost $30,000 for computer systems. This was $18,000. You can see what some of the specifications are. This is from Hewlett-Packard. 
IBM had more expensive computers. Perkin Elmer was one that had a really expensive computer. This is around $40,000 for this. And y the nice thing about it is it could support 32 users, so 32 different people simultaneously using the computer system, but it was still rather expensive. And that's when IBM, ca IBM came out with the personal computer. And so by the time IBM did that, they ended up taking over from Radio Shack. And so you can see the pricing here. The IBM computer is about $3,000 compared with the ones that Radio Shack had. And IBM was a much bigger company than Radio Shack and so was able to have more competitive pricing. And this is what an IBM personal computer looked like at the beginning. The interesting thing is IBM didn't make very much of the, any of the components in here. So the central processing unit came from Intel Corporation, and that became the standard for personal computers. Still is the standard today. The beginning uh, t Texas Instruments was used to make the random access memory for this computer, and Fujitsu made the ROM for this computer. The monitor was made by Zenith Corporation, a large television manufacturing company. Uh, Keytronics made the keyboard. Western Digital made the diskette drives. So you can see IBM wasn't making very much of anything here. Well, they were making the logo that they put on the side of the computer. But this became the IBM Personal Computer, or abbreviated PC. And so people talk about PC. This is where it all started. And then some people decided to try and make portable computers. So one of the companies that was doing this at the beginning was Osborne. And they had that keyboard that would just flip down and then the computer itself was portable. You can see the little tiny screen in the middle of that and then a couple of diskette drives that are surrounding the screen on the left and the right. This product didn't last very long because nobody could read the screen. It was so small. Uh, Compaq is another company that came out with a product that was about the size of a small suitcase. And this was a portable computer. So you can see the keyboard is attached to the computer there. And it, it just folded up and made the bottom of it. But people used to travel with these things. You can see the screen is rather small. It's got a couple of diskette drives over on the right. Uh, small computer, very expensive. And it was the idea of a portable. They, it was a pretty popular product for quite a while. And then laptops came out and really eclipsed this. And so it became much less expensive and much smaller. They weighed a lot less. The interesting thing is that computers were really kept alive and made really um, affordable because of the fact that people had software for them. And so one of the software packages is something from Peachtree Corporation. And you can see here, this is what it looked like. It was a, a screen that had a little bit of color on it, not very much. But that wasn't the point. It was used for business, business and accounting. and. The, that was the main reason that people were buying computers at the beginning, was to be able to do business processing on a personal computer level. So Peachtree was a company that was very, very important for uh, creating standards that people used for accounting systems. That was, that was one of the main reasons people bought a computer. Apple came out with another model, the Apple II, and I had mentioned that a little bit earlier. And you can see that it's got... The computer and keyboard on the bottom, the monitor on the top, and a couple of diskette drives on the side. Apple gave a lot of these away, as I mentioned. They gave a lot of these away to the schools. And in order to sell them and make some money, the thing that actually kept Apple in business was a software product from another company, not from Apple. But it was a company called Visical, and they made the first electronic spreadsheet that was used for personal computers. And so we'll talk more about spreadsheets later in the class. So I'll talk about Excel and Google Sheets and numbers for the Mac. But VisiCalc was the product that kept the Apple II computer because it only worked on the Apple II. So it kept the Apple II in, in business and kept Apple Corporation in business uh, in the in the 80s when this was first coming out because uh, it, was, it was the breakthrough product for them. And then another reason people use personal computers was word processing. And so the company that made the best word processing software at the time, this is in the 80s and the 90s, was WordPerfect Corporation. And so that was another reason, main reason, that people were buying personal computers was to be able to do word processing. So you have those three things, accounting for business, spreadsheets for business, and word processing. And so that was 
really those three things are what made personal computing happen at the very beginning. And there were two standards that came about at the time and two standards emerged and they actually are still the standards today. One was the IBM PC standard. So that was something that was based on Intel CPUs and was compatible with all other personal computers. So IBM really started the beginning of a revolution. So you had Hewlett Packard and Dell, Acer, Asus, all companies that make personal computers, but they're all ad adhering to the IBM standard. And so th the computer companies I just mentioned, Lenovo is another one of them. These are all called clones. And so what they are is computers that are all built by other companies, but they are compatible with the IBM PC and they all use Intel central processing units. The other standard that came about was the Apple Mac standard and it was totally different than IBM PCs. Um, their processors were made by Motorola Corporation at the beginning, PowerPC, and then later Intel. So today actually the, the Apple Macs use uh, Intel processors inside of them. But those products were not compatible with other personal computers. In fact, they were something called proprietary. So Apple has a proprietary technology, which means that there are no other companies that manufacture computers that are compatible with Apple. Apple's the only company that does that. Uh, very different than the IBM PC standard. So you have the clones versus the proprietary. And those, so you have those two things. And that's still the, still the case today. So interesting thing, technology advancements are not linear, but they're exponential. So somebody came up with this idea a long time ago. It was actually one of the people that started Intel Corporation. Gordon Moore came up with this idea that technology doubled about every two years. And so what, what he was talking about was the amount of uh, components that could be put on a silicon wafer. And that's what the, it's showing here. This person's holding a wafer of silicon. So the amount of components that could go on there doubles every two years and you can see how steep the curve has become and that means the technology is advancing at a very very fast rate now uh, it even goes faster than the chart here only goes up to 2015 but you can imagine how how steep the curve is now the technology curve and so i wanted to end the presentation just by talking about some of the major companies both computer companies and software companies that have affected personal computing. So one of them is IBM and certainly that probably the major one at the beginning was they set all the standards for the PC and all the clones. So that, that was big. They were all based on uh, Intel central processing units and still are. Intel is the largest manufacturer of microprocessors. So they're, they're a dominant company, the dominant company as far as the processing unit goes in central, uh, central processing units in computers. Microsoft is the biggest software company in the world and so they're responsible for the Windows operating system and the Office products, so Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, and then a lot of other software products and they're, they're the dominant software company for PCs. Apple, of course, uh, more than just a computer company, a consumer electronics company, so they have, in addition to the Mac computer, they have the iPad, iPod, iPhone, so all consumer electronics in addition to computers. Interestingly enough, Xerox is a company that was a major inventor of some technology. So Xerox invented the mouse, they invented networks, they invented the graphical user interface. And even though you don't see Xerox's name on products, they, they were the inventor of a lot of the technology that we use today. And a lot of this was done in Palo Alto at Xerox's research center in Palo Alto. Cisco is another company that is very, very important for personal computers because they invented uh, technology that's being used for networks and data communication. We'll talk more about them later on when we talk more about networks. Uh, Adobe, very um, important software company because they manufacture Photoshop which is for um, digital media. They make Premiere, which is digital video, Audition, which is digital sound, uh, PDF and Acrobat, and then a lot of other products that they make. The Adobe Creative Suite is what a lot of their products are known as. Uh, Intuit is a company that kind of took over where Peachtree had designed a lot of software. So Intuit is responsible for the QuickBooks accounting software, and that's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that people will buy 
a small computer for businesses to be able to do accounting, and QuickBooks is definitely the dominant product there. Google, of course, in, in addition to being a search engine, they have the Android operating system, and then some free versions of Office software. So we have Google Docs for word processing, Google Sheets for spreadsheets, uh, forms. Uh, there's also a presentation product that they make. So Google is a very important company as well. And then the last one I wanted to mention as far as the companies go is Oracle. And they're based in Belmont. And they do database management system for large computers. And so even though this is not a personal computer company, the uh, personal computer products, their products are very, very important for all kinds of computer networks. So anytime we use a personal computer system to contact a large organization, maybe it's a bank or an insurance company or perhaps something like Amazon, uh, we're, we're using the Oracle database management systems that are on operating on very large computer systems. So I thought I would mention them as well because they're, they're a pretty dominant company that's used here. So anyway, a real quick overview of personal computers and the history of personal computers. Uh, there's a, certainly a lot more to talk about, and we will cover a lot of that stuff in future, future presentations. But that's it for now. Thanks.